Amen. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Calvary Chapel Northwest. Tonight we are continuing our study through the book of Genesis. Our text tonight is Genesis 33, 18 to Genesis 34, 31. So if you turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along as we study it. Before we begin, though, let's offer a word of prayer for the recent tragedies in our land, which are very close to our home here. Father God, we come to you, Lord. And dear God, although it may seem like evil is triumphing, Lord, we know, dear God, that you are in control. We know, Lord, that you are sovereign, that you are loving, and we thank you for that, Lord God. Father, for the, the children that lives have been taken, we thank you, Lord, for your grace that brings those too young to come to an age of accountability. They're with you, Lord God, and we thank you and we praise you for that. But, Lord, we know that many hearts are broken of parents and relatives and friends that have lost these children. So, God, we pray for your comfort. We pray, Lord God, that tonight we will put off the heaviness of mourning, dear God, and put on the garment of praise. Speak to us through your word, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please follow along with me as I read, starting in Genesis 33, 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram. And he pitched his tent before the city, and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. Chapter 34. Now Dinah... The daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamar, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamer spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves, so you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamar, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. And the words please Hamar and Shechem, Hamar's son, so the young men did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. And Hamer and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city. 
and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of this city. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamar and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for this portion of Scripture which is before us. God, we ask that you speak to our hearts and draw us close to yourself. Dear God, if there is any listening to me that does not know you as Savior, I pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit that you would draw them to the place where they realize that they need you, Lord, that they are a sinner and they need to be saved by grace, and that they surrender themselves and are born again today. Father, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jacob had arrived in the land of of Canaan, the land of his inheritance, the land that God had promised. He is to inherit the entire country, but he has not possessed it yet. So he pitches his tent before the city of Shechem, not in the city, but outside of the city, and he needed space for his cattle to graze. He also undoubtedly did not want to intermingle with the inhabitants of Shechem, so he was outside the city. He purchased a place where he would pitch his tent. He wanted a place that he could call his own. And this place will remain his. For long afterwards, this is where his son Joseph would be buried, even after the family had to go to Egypt because of famine. He would still have that place. That's where Joseph would be buried. So now we proceed on to chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34 is a very interesting chapter to me. When you approach God's word, you must approach it asking yourself, what is it that God wants to speak to me? in this particular passage, any given passage. Most times, it's very clear. Take John chapter 3, for example, with Jesus meeting with Nicodemus. Very clear passage. You must be born again if you want to go to heaven. In fact, the entire gospel of John has a clear and stated purpose. John 2, verse 30 31 says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We see that message. 
bleeding through almost every passage in the Gospel of John. Very clear the purpose. But Genesis 34 is a little bit different. It's interesting not only because of what it says, but also because of what it doesn't say. You see, it records events that happened, but without any commentary from God. It doesn't tell us what God thinks about these things. So we must take what we know about God from the whole of Scripture and superimpose that onto these events in order to understand truly what it is God is trying to communicate to us in this chapter. Verse 1 of 34 says, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Some years have transpired since Jacob left Laban in Paden Aram. Jacob was with Laban for 20 years. He married after being there seven years, working for Rachel, which gives him 13 years to have 11 sons and one daughter. Dinah was born near the time of Joseph, his last son born. So when Jacob left paid in Aram, Dinah was still a little girl. I would guess somewhere between four and maybe six years old. In our story here, Dinah is probably somewhere between 12 and 14 years of age. That would mean that there are several years that are unaccounted for where Jacob could have visited his brother Esau in Seir, if you remember my comments from last week. So Dinah, at the age of 12 to 14 years old, is certainly marriage age in that culture. And the first verse of this chapter is instructive. Jacob has moved close to this city with inhabitants who do not share the belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These people do not have the moral convictions of God's people, so we must ask ourselves the question, is this where Jacob is supposed to be? When God told Jacob to get away from Laban, he told Jacob this, Genesis 31, verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. After the events of this chapter, this is what God says in Genesis 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Why is Jacob in Shechem and not in Bethel? So the first thing to ponder is this. Could Jacob have spared his family an enormous amount of pain had he been where God wanted him to be rather than where he wanted to be, where he chose to be? The next issue is a parenting issue. Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. She wanted to see how they dressed, their mannerisms, what they were like. It appears that Dinah is unsupervised, not chaperoned. As parents, the well-being of our children is our responsibility. As godly parents, their well-being includes the safeguarding of them against the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. In our day and age, you must understand the spiritual warfare that is raging all around you. You must understand that the God of this world, the devil, wants your children. And there is a constant onslaught 
of information seeking to draw them away from God and away from you. You cannot win this war if you allow your children unsupervised access to the internet, to social media, and to much that is on television. Your children are being targeted, even at the earliest of ages, to accept and embrace the ungodly satanic values of this world. Dinah's curiosity had brought her to a place where she was unprotected and where the surrounding culture saw a young woman who was unsupervised and unchaperoned as easy prey. Verse 2, and when Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. What is certain from this verse is that Shechem, the prince of this country, had sex with Dinah outside of the sanctioned bounds of holy matrimony. Other things are not so certain. Many translations use the word rape. But was Dinah actually raped? Was she forced to have sex against her will? It's not as cut and dried as you might think. You see, biblical Hebrew does not have a term for rape. The Bible does, however, speak of instances where this does occur. The most notable and clear case of rape involves King David's son, Amnon, raping his half-sister, Tamar. That account is found in 2 Samuel 13, verses 1 through 18. We'll go through that story of clear-cut rape because there are some important comparisons to make. I will try and summarize some of it. It tells us that Absalom, David's son, had a lovely sister, and her name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So, Absalom, Amnon, both sons of David, Tamar, the sister of Absalom, the half-sister of Amnon. Amnon loved her goes on to say that Amnon was so distressed, he was so lovesick that he couldn't eat. He's obsessed with Tamar. Amnon has a friend, crafty fella called Shimei, or, or actually Jonadab, the son of Shimei, sees his friend Amnon. What's wrong with you? Oh, I'm in love with Tamar. Tell you what, this is what you do. Act like you're sick. And then when your father David comes to see you, tell him to have Tamar come and bring you some food. Crafty, right? So he does it. He plays sick. David comes in and he asks for Tamar to bring him something to eat. So David tells Tamar, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare some food for him. Tamar goes. She needs him some cakes. She puts it before him, but he refuses to eat it. And then he sends everybody out of the room. Everybody leave and tells Tamar, won't you bring it in the bedroom and feed me with your own hand? Now I'm going to read, starting in verse 11. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. But she answered, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, speak to the king 
for he will not withhold me from you. Tamar is pleading with him. Don't do this wicked thing. If you talk to your father, David, and ask him, can you marry me? He will allow it. But do not do this evil thing. Verse 14, however, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. Clear cut rape. No doubt about it. Yet this is preceded with how much he loved her. He loved her. Look at verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. He had got what he wanted. He's kicking her out now. So she said to him, No, indeed, the, the evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant pushed her out and bolted the door behind her. Can you imagine this scene? He has violated and disgraced his half-sister Tamar. And after he uses her, he discards her like used toilet paper. Now back to our text. Verse 3, but his soul, Shechem's, was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamar, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. So there is an apparent difference in these two stories. Amnon was clearly motivated by lust. His subsequent actions were clearly despicable. Tamar begged him not to do such a thing, yet he forced her and then threw her out in disgrace. Shechem, on the other hand, has genuine feelings for Dinah. He wants to marry her and have her as his wife. Therefore, there's a temptation here to justify Shechem's actions based on his feelings. Now, we cannot be sure whether Shechem forced Dinah or if the intercourse was consensual. But either way, he violated her. And that cannot be understated. Shechem was not married to Dinah. So any sexual contact with her, whether consensual or not, was violating her. And that is just as true today as it was back then. Men, if you have had sexual contact with a woman that you were not married to, then you have violated her. You have sinned against God, and you have sinned against that woman, whether it was consensual or not. Now, Shechem's feelings for Dinah are real. I concede that. But right now, there is someone in this city who is married and has real feelings for someone that's not their spouse. But those feelings, even though they are genuine, does not make it right, does it? The world would gush over Shechem's expression of love. He not only desires to marry her, but he is willing, as we shall see later, to do everything that her brothers require of him in order to marry her. This might be hard to hear, but... The love that Shechem has for Dinah is really no different than the love that Amnon had for Tamar. Both of these declarations of love are based on intense feelings of desire. Now, in the case of Amnon, his falling in love 
only lasted until the end of the sexual intercourse. Then he immediately fell out of love and fell into hate. Shechem's feelings have only intensified after the sexual intercourse, but that does not justify sex outside of marriage. What is wrong with our world today is that right and wrong has been subjugated to feelings. Why can't two consenting adults be free to love whoever they want to love? Have you heard that one? That's the mantra of our time. And the truth is, you are free to love whoever you want to love. God himself has given you the freedom to choose. You have free will. But that does not make your choice right. My job is to tell you that if you choose your feelings over what God's word says is right, then there will be consequences for your choices. You see, the world is lying to you. There is no court in any country that can overrule God's word. Your choices may be legal under this world's jurisdiction, but you will answer to God ultimately. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. I love my job because I'm not very creative, and I don't have to be. All I have to do is take what God has given me, his word, and tell you what it says. Simply teaching the word of God, simply. The world might not like what I have to say, but that's okay because I'm not here to please the world. I'm here to please God Almighty. I don't fear what man can do to me. I fear God. Man can destroy my body, but God can destroy both my body and soul in hell, I fear God, and you should fear him as well. Satan has done a masterful job of using his power in this world to convince people that their feelings is what that matters most. If I feel that I am a woman trapped in a man's body, then I can call myself a woman. And society has devolved to such a place where it validates and celebrates that choice, which is against clear and demonstrable truth of biology. If I go to a doctor and he examines me without me declaring my gender, that doctor would have to come to the conclusion that I am a man. But in our society, I can just as I am, say that I am a woman. And society will say, yes, you're a woman. That is insanity. Amen. That's utter confusion. Amen. Well done, Satan. Well done. If I have strong sexual feelings for a child, then it should be okay for me to express those feelings, right? Because that's who I am. Maybe if I identify as a three-year-old, I could have sex with a three-year-old. We're going there. I promise you we are going there where this world will accept pedophilia as normal and every other type of wickedness that there is. Why? Because my feelings... My intense desires, that is what matters. That's what the world is telling us. With such a wicked philosophy, is it any wonder how an 18-year-old could decide he wants to shoot his own grandmother 
and then go into a classroom and kill innocent children. Why not? It's what he feels. He has grown up in a world that says it's all about what you feel. Your feelings are reality, not what is objectively right and wrong. It breaks my heart. It breaks the heart of God that that murderer grew up in a world where people do what is right in their own eyes, not what God's word objectively tells us is right. He's now burning in hell, having been used by Satan to bring heartache and devastation to so many people. Back to our text, verse 5. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. What's going on here? Jacob hears that his daughter has been defiled, and he holds his peace? This is definitely Jacob, not Israel. He's acting in his flesh. The ruler of the land has defiled his daughter, and Jacob is acting in fear. Verse 6, then Hamar, the father, of, the, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, and the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard it, the men were grieved, very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Jacob's sons understand the egregiousness of this act. Lying with Jacob's daughter is a thing that ought not to be done. Feelings don't matter. Intense emotions don't matter. When something ought not to be done, that is a matter of what is objectively right and what is objectively wrong. Feelings don't matter. Verse 8, Hamer spoke to them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as wife. No apology, right? She's free game in this society. There's no apology for what he has done, just my son wants her. Give him to her as a wife. Make marriages with us. We'll make marriages with you. You'll have our daughters. We'll have your daughters. You'll dwell in the land. All of our possessions will be one. Let's not forget something, though. Let's, let's go back, way back, to Genesis 24, verses 1 through 4. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, Please, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife from my son Isaac. It was already well established to Abraham that his descendants, God's people, should not commingle and intermarry with others. It was passed on to his son, Genesis 28, 1 through 2. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethul, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. What Hamar and Shechem has proposed is absolutely unacceptable. Verse 11. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I'll give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift. I'll give according to what you say to me. But give the young woman as a wife. Shechem's intense desire is palpable. But again, strong desire does not justify that which is against God's will. 
Verse 13, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They told him, we can't do this thing, give our sister to somebody that's uncircumcised. That'd be a reproach. On this condition, we'll consent. All you guys got to get circumcised. You do that, we're good to go. We agree. We'll intermarry, we'll mingle, but everybody got to get circumcised. They're straight up lying. They're using the covenant of circumcision as their tool for revenge. They're minimizing the true covenant with God. There's no mention of a relationship with God. There's no mention of what this covenant actually means, only this physical requirement of circumcision. They did a good job, though. Verse 18, their words, please, Hamer and Shechem, Hamer and son. Young man did not delay to do this thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He's totally head over heels for her. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. Shechem is said to be an honorable guy. He has good intentions, more honorable than the rest of his father's household. And the funny thing is that had this not been an intermarriage, which was not allowed, Shechem is doing the exact thing that the law, which will come years later, requires a Jewish man to do in this exact same situation. Look at Exodus twenty two sixteen. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. That's what he's doing. Deuteronomy also says that he would have to marry her and could never divorce her. That's what the law will say in the future, and that's what he's doing. He wants to pay the bride price, but he is outside of the people of God, so it is not allowed. Verse 20, Hamor and Shechem, they go to the gate of their city. That's where all the, the meetings happen. And they, they lay it out to the men. They tell them the deal. We're going to live in peace with these guys. Everything they have will be ours. But this is what we need to do. We need to get circumcised. Shechem sells it, and all the men agree. Seems like a good deal to them. Verse 25, now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword, came boldly upon the city, and killed all the males. And they killed Hamar and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. Now, obviously, Levi and Simeon couldn't have killed all these men by themselves. They would have had help, but they were the leaders, so they are given the responsibility of this massacre. It's also interesting that Dinah was in Shechem's house. There's no explanation why. Was she already given to Shechem his marriage before the circum? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Verse 27, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their ox, and their donkeys, what was in the city, what was in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Now, what Simeon and Levi did is excessive, obvious. They've killed all of the men of this town. They've taken everything that they own. They've taken their wives and their children captive. I believe it's excessive. God doesn't mention it. It's up to us to decide. Jacob, however, when he is on his deathbed and he is prophesying over his sons, he pronounces a curse on Simeon and Levi because of their violence, because of this instance. Verse 30, 
Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. Now Jacob is correct to rebuke the excessive force of his sons. But Jacob is also wrong to fear the nations around him. Jacob should be fearing God, not man. Verse 31, but they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? It's the only answer that Jacob gets. It's true what they have said, but it does not justify what they've done. Again, there is no commentary from God on the events of this chapter. Much, though, was easy to understand just knowing God's character. And the primary thing is that we must always subordinate our feelings to God's objective word. God's infallible, inerrant word is the final authority in the life of a believer. It's not your feelings. It's not what you want. It's what God says. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Do you want to be justified? And what you said, then let God be true. Speak God's word, not man's word. Don't speak what's popular. Don't speak what the enemy is trying to infiltrate your mind with constantly through media and through everything else. You have to reject what you are being programmed to believe, right? You watch television. Television has programs, right? They're programming you. You reject that and you listen to what God's word says. It's not going to be popular. As the world gets darker and darker, God's word will become more unpopular. But God's word doesn't change. God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We live our life on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. He is unchanging. His salvation is forever, and it is God, in God, that we trust. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for another chapter in your word, dear God, where we get to learn from the examples that you have laid out for us to learn from. So much emotion going on, dear God, in this Bible study. We see one man just overtaken with lust who rapes his half-sister and then cast her away in disgrace. We see another man that, that, that has grown up in such a wicked area that he thinks he could just take a woman who he desires with no consequences, and all of it just results in unrighteousness and harm and pain. So, Father, let us, dear God, your children, commit ourselves, Lord, to following you wholeheartedly, to surrendering ourselves to you, Lord, and trusting you with all that we are. Lord, if there's any listening to this message that has not fully surrendered themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to offer them that opportunity. If you're listening and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you believe that Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross for your sin, that he was buried and that he rose from the grave on the third day, 
The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord means he is in control, not you. That requires repentance. You have to want to turn away from your sin. You have to want to surrender and give your life to God. If you are willing to give yourself to him, then you will be born again. God will change your heart. He will receive you as his child, and you will know that you have eternal life. I invite you to do so now. Simple prayer, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and be my Savior and my King. Be my Lord. Receive me to yourself. If you truly pray that prayer from the heart, God will receive you. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord God, as we were singing praises to you, Lord God, and I had my hands raised and my eyes closed. Lord God, I was just praying, Lord, that when I opened my eyes, I'd be looking into your face in glory. But Lord, you decided that there's yet more to do, so we remain. So Lord God, continue to fill us with your spirit, continue to shine through us in this dark world, and we will give you all of the praise and all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Please join us Sunday as we continue our study in the Gospel of John. Have a wonderful night in Jesus. God bless you.